Okay, Madam Chair, good afternoon. It looks like uh, everyone's here for our panelists. So we are live and uh, the webinar is on and recording. Thank you, John. Um, so if you'll go ahead and uh, pull up the agenda, I will call this Urban Renewal Agency of the City of Talent uh, for 6.30 PM uh, to order. Roll call, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Board Member Pomeranoff? Here. Vice Chair Clark? Here. Board Member Perry Miller? Here. Board Member Byers? Here. Board Member Prestigio? Board Member Prestigio? Board Member Prestigio is not present. Board Member Greider? Here. Madam Chair, you have a quorum. And uh, Madam Chair, I just wanted to take one second, we do have an uh, interpret, interpreter, uh, two interpreters working this evening, Yvonne and Nancy here, and uh, just uh, wanted to give one second um, before you start your introduction, if we could allow Nancy just to go over some of the uh, interpretation for the, anyone joining in on the webinar this afternoon. Of course, Nancy. Um, oh, let, let me take this question from member Byers. It was actually just a reminder. Thank you so much. And thank you both, um, Nancy and Ivan, for being here interpreting. Um, it's super helpful for interpreters if we pause every sentence or so to let them catch up with our rapid thoughts. Just a reminder for the evening. Thank you. So we're going to hear uh, from Nancy next. Yes, Madam Chair. Good evening, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. As you can see on your screen, there are some instructions to make language accessible, more accessible. Um, if you would like closed captioning, if reading um, and visualizing what, what is being said is easier, we invite you to go to the bottom and then click on closed captioning and it should show up for you. And this is just to improve accessibility and what it is that we're hearing from our amazing group of panelists. If we have um, Spanish speakers, there's also at the very bottom, there's a little icon with a globe. If you click on that and go tap on the Spanish option, it'll take you to this different channel and in that channel, you will be able to hear simultaneously what is being said in the English room and also the Spanish room. It's a really neat feature just to include, to be more inclusive of our participants and to bring everyone along at the same time. And that is it, thank you so much. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you for uh, joining us this evening uh, and providing interpretation uh, for this very important discussion. Um, so with that, item number two is an introduction to, to this evening's uh, open house. You know, <clears throat> in my role uh, representing the city of town, I attend a lot of regional meetings. Um, many of them we share uh, what each one of our commu uh, communities are working on and really learn from each other on best practices and, um, and other um, community, important community discussions. And recently while attending a business revitalization forum in the city of Phoenix, um, Phoenix city councilor Mulehofer presented a Phoenix Urban Renewal Agency investment plan um, where they're utilizing uh, their urban renewal investments to rebuild and revitalize within their damaged business district. And they showed uh, ways that they've already used for uh, investments uh, to build more workforce housing after the fire. And uh, they, they really did have an excellent plan. 
Um, also, FURA investments will be used as an, uh, in a collaborative project that will house the new fire department in the city of Phoenix. Phoenix knows what we know, and that is that urban renewals can be a powerful tool to rebuild and recover after catastrophic disaster. In fact, just today, uh, I was at an, uh, a Council of Government meeting, and in a report uh, from Medford, uh, the Medford Urban Renewal Agency um, are, is utilizing their investments uh, in response to housing shortages that were, uh, as they said, made um, worse by the Almeda and South Oba chain fires. Uh, the, talent, or the Medford Urban Renewal Agency approved uh, recently approved a proposed 115 unit complex um, of a new development that will bring more affordable housing to the city in the Liberty Par uh, Park neighborhood, as well as participating in a 60 unit apartment project of workforce housing in South, uh, on South Holly. I'm trying to go uh, slow. So if I'm um, moving too quickly, please don't hesitate to let me know. <clears throat> Here in Talent, uh, just last week, we held a business forum with Talent businesses, and they shared with us their challenges uh, and told us the many ways that the economic revitalization in our city is so urgent and so critical. Uh, we knew then what we know now, and that is that urban renewal agencies are just one tool in the toolbox in order for communities that have been ravaged by disaster uh, um, in a way that we can use them to begin at, to hasten our long journey of, uh, of recovery and talent. So our hope for tonight is to hear from our residents and other interested parties, uh, what are the good priorities for our community recovery and explore how urban renewal work plan might fit in as a part of a larger, as a part of a larger recovery effort um, for the city of talent. So with that, um, it's my pleasure to introduce, um, is it uh, Representative Pam Marsh uh, for an update on recovery funding for communities within the Rogue Valley. Thank you so much, Mayor. Um, and thank you to all of you. It's really wonderful to be here with you this evening. My job is just to give you an update primarily from what happened from the short session uh, of the legislature that ended about a month ago. Um, and then we will hear from uh, experts who will be able to tell you what, what's really the bigger news, which is um, the, about the federal money that we got. Um, we have, the state has received $422 million in CDBG disaster recovery money um, that has to be spent across the state. We don't get it all here, but we will get a significant portion of it because we had, certainly when you look at housing, a disproportionate amount of the loss in September, 2020. So in a minute, Alex Campbell is gonna tell you more about that and the process for allocating that money. So I won't address that, but I will give you some a few other updates from the short session. I think the biggest news is that we were able to secure some financial stability for Phoenix Talent and the other three school districts that were uh, impacted in a major way during the September 2020 wildfires because of the way that Oregon allocates school funding based on essentially butts and seats, um, number of children who are present times a formula gives you a total school funding. Um, Phoenix Talent stood to lose potentially millions of dollars in funding as the community rebuilds. The district had, as you all know, 700 children who lost housing, 350 of them have yet to return to the community. And we need a robust school district. We need a robust school district, not only to care for the children and families and staff who are still carrying the trauma and the displacement caused by the wildfire, but we also really need a robust school district as a pillar of our community redevelopment. Um, as talent in Phoenix and the parts of Jackson County that were hit, begin to grow back, people will look at us and make assessments as to whether they wanna return or whether they wanna be here in part based on the health of the school district. So we are very happy that we were able to secure a total of $25 million to backfill the impacted school districts through the 24-25 school year. Um, at that point, uh, they will revert to the normal funding formula and we'll have to see where the, the community is in the rebuilding process. 
but we bought ourselves a few years of security and that was something we were very pleased to bring home. Um, we also were able to get additional money to fill some gap funding needed by the Phoenix Public Safety Building. Um, we got a significant amount of funding to uh, combine in a single structure, the police station, the fire facility, which was burned in the fire, and the city hall, new big brand new building, but it fell a little bit short. So we were able in the short session to make up that gap. Um, and then um, the, the other thing that I really wanna talk about um, is where we are in resources that are available to people who are trying to rebuild their own homes. So I just wanna make sure that we flag a few programs that are available to make sure that people have full understanding of them and the opportunity to um, look to those programs as they go into the rebuilding process. Uh, the first is that we have a grant slash loan program for individuals who are trying to replace their manufactured homes. This is an income qualified program. So you do have to qualify with your income. But if you do, there is the potential in this purchase program to get as much money as you need in the form of a grant um, to allow you to buy a new manufactured home um, to replace the one that was burned in the fire. This is a, a program that was put together by the state to provide ultimate flexibility because we know that for people who lost homes in, in the manufactured homes in, in the wildfire, um, it's gonna be a stretch to buy a new manufactured home. And in order for those people to come back to the community, we need to give them a helping hand. So the state um, grant program is intended to do that. Um, it's just been revised, it's available now, and anybody who is interested in finding out more about it should go to ACCESS, um, which is serving as the housing navigating, navigation center for all of the rebuilding process um, in the Almeda fire. The second program I wanna call out is the Energy Trust also has an incentive for people who are trying to buy a manufactured home. Um, again, that's an incentive that's up to $15,000. Um, to replace the manufactured home that burned in the fire. It's a tremendous opportunity and anybody who is contemplating a purchase right now should make sure that they look at that energy trust program because it could be beneficial. And then we have energy efficiency and fire hardening incentives. Those were both funded by the legislature in 2021. Those programs are being run by the Department of Energy and the um, Oregon Building Codes Department. Those incentives um, will apply, those two incentives will apply to the purchase of manufactured homes in certain circumstances, but they also apply to brick and mortar homes. So anybody who has already rebuilt or is contemplating rebuilding or purchasing a manufactured home should look at those programs to see if there is a benefit there. If you've already built your home, uh, it's not a problem. The energy efficiency and fire hardening incentives can be applied retroactively. So even if you're in your home, please check out those opportunities to see if you can get a little bit of extra um, support. Because even if you built your home, undoubtedly you have other expenses that you're looking at that you could do some help with. Um, finally, I wanna flag just a couple of places to get more information about the programs that I've just mentioned. Now, on my legislative website, which is Representative Pam Marsh, you will find a section um, that's tagged Manufactured Home Resources. And if you're interested, go to that section. You will find both first a recording of Zoom sessions that we did to explain all of these programs about a week and a half ago. So you're welcome to listen to the recording, but you will also find the PowerPoints, the one pagers that describe all of these programs, the, the home loan program, the energy trust program, the energy efficiency program, and the fire hardening program. So Representative Pam Marsh, look for manufactured housing um, resources, but note that again, a couple of those programs apply to brick and mortar homes as well as manufactured homes. And then finally, I wanna flag our good timing because tomorrow morning at 8 a.m., if there's anyone who is interested, there will be a seminar um, that will tell you about the energy trust programs, the fire hardening and the energy efficiency programs. Um, that's an hour in the morning at 8 a.m. If you're interested in getting a link to that, email me tonight. Um, I don't know if we have the potential for posting that information for public dissemination uh, in the course of this webinar, but if not, you can always email me rep.pammarsh at oregonlegislature.gov, and I will make sure you have a link to 8 a.m. tomorrow where you'll hear the experts talk firsthand about these programs and what advantages they may bring to you. 
So that's it for my update. Thank you so much for the opportunity to chime in tonight. Um, and thank you to all of you for coming together. It's always so important to have our communities talking to each other. Thank you, Representative Marsh. Um, the next item on the agenda is item number four, and it's the Oregon Housing Community Service. And uh, I believe Alex Campbell is here to talk to us tonight about what's happening on that front. Hey, good evening. Thank you, Thank you Mayor. Um, yeah, happy to do so. Um, as Mayor Darby said, I'm, I'm with Oregon Housing and Community Services, the Disaster Recovery and Resilience Section. We are, the, we are the agency that Governor Brown has directed to receive and administer the, uh, the $422 million grant that Representative Marsh mentioned. Um, from HUD. So if you if you go ahead, I'll, I'll start talking about about um, about that. Uh, you will see um, hopefully quite soon start, start seeing some coverage in the press about this program. Uh, we're using um, a different branding, so we don't have to say CDBGDR to everybody uh, constantly. Um, we're just going to call the effort Re Oregon, <clears throat> and uh, the Re is for recovery and rebuilding. Um, and uh, no, it's not immediately obvious what maybe Re Oregon means, but we really liked it because it uh, it's also makes sense in Spanish. There are a lot of Spanish words that start with re um, that um, we're going to support. So that's one of the primary fo focuses that we're we're using is making sure that we are speaking to and addressing the Latino, Latina, Latinx uh, population here in Jackson County that was really heavily hit. Um, we will be emphasizing equity in other dimensions as well including uh, income and, uh, and folks who have disabilities. We will be investing in ways that make our communities more resilient and our housing more resilient going forward. That means better prepared for future disasters. And um, the program will also support investments in communities as well as just the housing. So, we have a large grant. The money can be spent in the counties that were hardest hit by the 2020 Labor Day fires. 70% of the spending must benefit low to moderate income households. And that's, that's the 80% uh, of area median income is the technical language. In Jackson County, what that really means is and it's adjusted for how many people live in the household. But for a single, single person, it'd be about $36,000. For a family of four, it's a little over $50,000. So a lot, many of the programs will be open to folks that qualify at that income standard. There are a lot of programs that will open to folks who meet that income standard first. And as we're able to serve folks at higher incomes, we'll invite them in as well. Uh, we do have a commitment to spend at least 15% of the money to for mitigation. And that's, that's really the resilience, the preparedness, making us better prepared for future disaster. Um, we are working on an action plan is what um, we're, we're up to. And we're gonna, we're gonna publish a draft action plan early next week. And one thing I wanna emphasize is it's our first action plan and we will amend it. We will change it as we learn more about the needs. Um, but this is gonna be our, our, what we're gonna focus on is the programs that we wanna, we wanna get out first. Um, and when I go ahead to the next slide and talk a little bit about what, what's in that draft action plan. So, there is over $200 million to help folks who lost their homes, replace those homes. That would include folks who were living in manufactured homes. We hope to um, replace those with modular homes wherever we can, at the very minimum, uh, very uh, high quality manufactured homes that would be resilient 
to um, a future disaster that, that are energy efficient. There's also over $100 million there to assist folks who were renters and displaced by the fire. Um, and we want to spend that money in ways that allows them to become homeowners as well. So that, that $100 million would include uh, funds to purchase new, new homes. Um, it would also include funding to establish new cooperatively owned uh, uh, parks for, um, for, those for those folks to place those homes. If folks have their own property, certainly that, pro that program could support that. But to the extent that we can, we want to, um, we want to help people go into a, a better situation than they were before. There is $17 million allocated to continue to help people um, live and survive um, as we're working on, on building all this new housing. Uh, that could be rent assistance, that could be assistance moving into a new apartment. Um, we have a lot of folks, as you all know, in the FEMA direct housing mission, in, um, in motels, and uh, we want to continue to enable them to move into uh, better housing, even while we're working on the, the long-term solution. There is money to continue to support housing counseling, the kinds of uh, housing navigation that Representative Marsh mentioned that's available through ACCESS. Um, we also provide um, the, the draft action plan includes money for legal assistance. We know that as folks rebuild, there are a lot of challenges to doing that. And uh, often folks are gonna need some, some legal support to do that. So those are the housing programs. As you can see, it's the large majority of the funding. Uh, we also allocated 10% to infrastructure or mitigation investments. And, and for those, we'd be looking to local governments like the city of talent to, um, to tell us where to, what your priorities are in terms of those infrastructure investments. We, what we said is we want to fund infrastructure investments that support the creation of housing, but we define that broadly to include things like parks or pedestrian and pedestrian safety improvements to, to, make, to make not just housing, but neighborhoods and communities. Um, and there is some money for planning um, that could be used again as the communities define your, your planning needs for recovery. We're setting aside what seems like a really large amount for administrative costs. Uh, we're very hopeful that as we go through this program, we'll be able to reallocate some of that money to program. But there are a lot of expenses that um, HUD requires us to do that we have to call administrative costs. And that includes a lot of monitoring and reporting. Um, so until we're confident that we can spend less on that, we're gonna reserve that amount so we can um, not go to the Oregon legislature a few years from now and say, we, we, need, we need more money to support this program. So if you go ahead, thank you. Um, we've done a lot of engagement up to now, um, had uh, several really good discussions with the um, city talent, city council. Um, on May 2nd, as I said, next week, we're gonna pat, uh, publish the draft action plan and um, we will, if you're interested in getting that, that notice directly, um, the best way to do that right now is to just put into your search engine, if you have internet access, CDBGDR Oregon, and you'll get to our website and there's a place to sign up to get direct emails from us. So if you do that, we'll send you an email on Monday with a link to the draft action plan, um, both in English and in Spanish, the plan will be available. We're, we'll do a public hearing um, at the Talent Community Center on May 19th uh, with encouragement from one of our advisory committees. We're gonna, we're gonna do another uh, similar or essentially the same event next week, uh, sorry, the following week um, that will be specifically for Spanish speakers. 
So there'll be more information coming out about that. So through, through the month of May, essentially, we'll be inviting public comment about all aspects of the draft action plan. We're gonna be incorporating that comment and taking that to our governing body, the Oregon State Housing Stability Council on June 3rd, and with their help, finalize the plan and submit it to HUD on June 8th. Um, I should say at this point, we, we know this is too late. There are a lot of people still struggling through their recovery 18 months after the fire. We wish we were uh, much further ahead than we when we are. Uh, these dollars were just made available to the state. Um, we just got the rules and the instructions for developing the, the draft action plan this spring. So we're going to move forward as quickly as we can, but that will be some, still some time. We, we will have approval for HUD on the, uh, on the action plan. We expect er, in early fall and expect to and hope to be taking applications for the housing programs around in the early 2023. Again, I, I know that that's painful to say, it's painful for me to say, I'm sure it's painful for folks to hear, um, but that's one of the reasons that we, we have included more money to continue to help folks in their interim housing solutions. I really appreciate the time to, to share, share a little bit about what we're up to and uh, Thank, thank you for uh, making some space for me. Thank you, Alex. And I just want to say, um, as a member of the ad hoc community uh, uh, committee that's helped um, shape up the um, proposed plan uh, that Alex was just talking about, um, I had an opportunity to hear from uh, folks all over the state that uh, that are helping to prioritize these funds, and um, you know. Uh, Mackenzie River area where they had such uh, horrible fires as an example. And I just am so proud um, to be part of a community that really elevated, um, you know, the outcomes to be um, shared equity and cooperative type um, projects uh, for um, ultimately home ownership for those folks who were displaced by the fires and uh, really have lesser means to, to come back home. It was just really um, a great experience to be representing that agenda. And I just wanna thank um, the city council for advancing uh, those priorities and, and um, they were uh, uh, a pleasure to represent. And thank you for all the work you're doing, Alex. And thank you also Representative Marsh for all the work that you've done on this as well. Um, <clears throat> So the next item on the agenda is item number five, Urban Renewal Agency short introduction to the consultant team. Uh, John? Yes, uh, thank you, Chair. So I'd, I'd first like to say, start off by saying thank you to Representative Marsh and to External Affairs Coordinator for OHCS, Alex Campbell, for presenting tonight. I'd also like to thank our Urban Renewal Consultant, Elaine Howard, for taking time out of her evening and busy schedule to join tonight's meeting to present on the Urban Renewal to our audience. The Alameda fire severely impacted the talent community, and today's talent's leadership continues to chart a path to long-term recovery through leveraging local, regional, state, and federal funding resources. But when listening to community members, I continue to learn that additional aid and support are necessary for community members to meet their rebuilding needs and goals. Tonight, I'm excited to have <laughs> Elaine Howard explain how Urban Renewal could help talent achieve some of its goals. Elaine Hart is probably the most experienced urban renewal consultant in the state of Oregon and has worked with more than 50 plus public bodies across the state of Oregon. The agency has been closely collaborating with Elaine's team for over a year since she approached us following the devastated effects of the Alameda fire. Talent couldn't be luckier than to have Elaine and her team help us out through this process. After Elaine's presentation this evening, we have Harry Weiss from Medford's Urban Renewal Agency in attendance to share some history and ongoing projects with a sister city in the Rogue Valley. I'd also like to personally thank Harry for taking time this evening to share examples of projects within a nearby city. And with that, Madam Chair, I would like to introduce Elaine Hard, who will I'll do a share screen and let her start her presentation. Thank you. Um, yes. 
I, I just want to mention really quick before you start, Elaine, that uh, we we are getting a reminder that um, we have uh, it's it's good to have a couple pauses now and then to let the uh, translator catch up. Yes, um, it's hard to be mindful of slowing down. I know uh, as a fast I, speaker myself. I also wanted to ask whether she wanted to provide information about how to access the interpreter um, icon at the bottom. I don't know if anybody else has joined. We, Elaine, we provided that information at the start. I, I know, I wondered if anyone joined since then. I don't know if you're able to see. I can't see on that side there, so. <laughs> okay. Okay, I'm just going to say it quickly then for, for anyone who is a Spanish speaker, if you go to the bottom of your screen, there is an icon that shows like a globe and you can click on that to hear this presentation in Spanish. Um, so hopefully that helps. And can everyone see my screen that has definitions up on it? Yes, <clears throat> excuse me. It's always helpful to start out with terminology because urban renewal is something that is not really understood and the terminology isn't something that we use every day. So when we talk about urban renewal, a lot of times people you will use the um, initials URA. URA stands for urban renewal area and an urban renewal area is a specific boundary area where projects may be undertaken in an urban renewal plan. And I'll describe the rest of that as we go through. So these all will tie together. The second is urban renewal plan. An urban renewal plan is a plan which, which will get approved by a city council, in this case being reviewed by the talent city council, to undertake projects in a specific area for the improvement of the community. TURA is the Talent Urban Renewal Agency. So it is the governmental body that would implement the Talent Urban Renewal Plan. Tax Increment Financing or TIF, TIF, are the funds or the money that's provided to that Urban Renewal Agency for undertaking projects in an urban renewal area. Taxing districts are referred to often because that is where the money comes from to provide that tax increment financing. And those taxing districts are the governmental bodies that collect property taxes. For example, the county, the city, the library, the fire district, the school district, and then other special smaller districts. <clears throat> Excuse me. Maximum indebtedness or MI, <clears throat> excuse me, is the legal term for the total amount of dollars that may be spent on projects, programs, and administration in an urban renewal area. If an area is adopted by the city council, they will establish that maximum indebtedness as they establish the urban renewal area. <clears throat> This presentation will cover what is urban renewal, how does urban renewal work, what types of projects are be, being considered in talent, how to provide input, and what are the next steps. This map shows the urban renewal area boundary that is being considered by the Talent City Council and Urban Renewal Agency. It is shown in blue on this map and you can see how it overlaps um, the Almeida fire perimeter and you can see the dotted line that shows the talent city limits. So the area in blue encompasses much of the area that was damaged, damaged including the manufactured home parks and much of the residential construction area. It also includes that commercial corridor where many of the businesses were damaged. Um, as we go through potential projects, uh, we'll show the boundary again at the end because some of the other projects that are 
uh, more recreation, urban canopy related projects um, are, are encompassed in some of those uh, other areas within the boundary. So urban renewal is basically a financing tool for cities and counties to use in areas where there are needs for improvements. It is allowed through state authority when a city itself has an urban renewal agency and that city adopts an urban renewal plan. Why is urban renewal a good tool for the city of talent? It provides funding to both implement city plans and address barriers to development in the following ways. In talent, the impacts of the fire has devastated much of the downtown. Those businesses are going to need assistance in rebuilding. A financing tool is needed to help rebuild the city and there aren't a lot of other tools to be accessed. There was a great presentation before this presentation about all the tools and money for housing, but none of those were available for businesses or commercial. Urban renewal can be part of a toolbox for rebuilding. So it is one potential funding source. It is not anticipated to be the only funding source. Urban renewal is not a new tax. Citizens are generally interested in the urban renewal boundary that's chosen and what projects will be completed, but their primary concern is how it will impact them. Most people want to know if creating an urban renewal area will increase their taxes. And the answer is no, it will not create an additional tax. The difference between urban renewal funding and other sources of funding that is available is that urban renewal impacts the property taxing districts, not the property tax payers. And remember when we did definitions at the first, those taxing districts are the city itself, the county, the fire district, the library district, um, and the education districts. This just shows in concept how that works. So we get property tax bills every November and pay those property taxes. That property tax revenue goes to all of those taxing districts. Those property tax revenues go up for only two reasons. There is a 3% allowed increase annually and the assessor generally will add that increase unless we're in a recession. And then if substantial improvements or new construction happens, then those property taxes can go up. When a city forms an urban renewal area, the property tax increases from the time the urban renewal area is established, go to the urban renewal agency for doing projects and programs within the urban renewal area. You can see that the green line going to the right shows what property tax revenue would go to all of the taxing districts. And that is the revenue at the time that the urban renewal area is established. Once it's established, any increases in property taxes go to the urban renewal agency and that's denoted or shown by the blue arrow going to the left. That is just for those properties within the urban renewal area. It is not for the entire city of talent. So it is a smaller portion of that area. There are always questions about how then the assessor calculates that if it is not a new tax. We put together this chart to help explain that. A property with an assessed value of $100,000 in talent would pay a property tax rate of $14.30 per thousand dollars of assessed value. This means that they would pay $1,430 of property taxes. If this property was not put into an urban renewal area, 
and the assessor increased the assessed value by 3%, the property is now worth $103,000 and the taxes on that would be $1,473. If this property were put into an urban renewal area this year and the assessor increased those values, whoops, sorry, those values by the 3% to the $103,000, that increase would be $42.90. That increase would go to the Urban Renewal Agency and the, all the other taxing districts would still get the amount of money that they originally we're getting off of the urban renewal area. This is just another way to show how that works. So the gray bar along the bottom shows that once an urban renewal area is established, the taxes based on the assessed value of the properties within that area continue going to all the taxing districts. The increase in taxes shown in blue on this chart that increase over time go to the Urban Renewal Agency until the area is completed. And at that point, the taxes, the full taxes off of the properties will go to all of those impacted taxing districts and increase the amount of money that they have to be able to provide services. Urban renewal and the impact on schools is different. It is an indirect impact. And you heard your representative a minute ago talk about the fact that, uh, Representative Marsh, that they were able to provide some continuity and stability for your schools, which is so important because schools are funded on a per student basis through the state school fund. Schools do not receive any less money if there is an urban renewal area in their community. They only receive less money if there are less students. In able to make uh, those schools whole, we have to provide the housing that allows those students to come back to the schools to reach those levels that were pre-fire to allow after this emergency funding that the legislature has allocated in the future to make sure that those numbers of students in the schools come back up to those pre-fire numbers. If those urban renewal projects provide improvements that help encourage new homes, the schools will benefit as the number of students will increase and the school's funding is based on the number of students they have in school. And again, this money comes from the taxing districts. So we've shown the different charts and the different ways of explaining that, but we want to just make sure to be very transparent that the impacts from an urban renewal area only and not from the entire city of talent is the impact on the taxing districts. All taxing districts serve different sizes of populations. If it's a county service area, it's larger than the city service area. So the actual impact on them will be a lower percentage impact than on the city itself. The percentage of the total budget impact from an urban renewal area in talent is different than the others because of the size of the taxing district. This shows what I'm trying, the point I am trying to make. We have done some initial financial analysis that we are reviewing and updating. That initial financial analysis projected these impacts on these taxing districts. The city of Talents overall, if, if the area was a 30 year area, the, the impact would be a little over $15 million over that 30 years, which would be an average of 18.6% of the overall city budget. So that's a, that's a large amount. If you look at Jackson County, their impact is $9.7 million, 
which is less than 1%. It is less than half of 1% of their permanent rate levy that they would get every year. The same is for the 4-H extension. It's a, whoops, rogue is spelled wrong there, I'm sorry. Um, it is 0.5% for Rogue Valley Transit. For the fire district, it is a lot of money, just like the cities is, it's $15.5 million. But as a percentage of their budget, it is 4.4% average, whereas for the city is 18.6. And that is because they have a much larger service area and get much more money as a permanent rate levy tax collection than the city does. And you can see for all of the other, um, the soil and water conservation district, the library, vector control, um, community college, Southern Oregon ESD, those are all under 1%. The Phoenix Talent School District is at 3.5, but again, that is not a direct impact to them. They are funded on a per pupil basis. So that impact is on the state school fund as same as the education service district. And the legislature has the ability to backfill those permanent rate property taxes that do not uh, come because they are going to urban renewal instead. The initial financial analysis that we uh, created that is being updated showed that the capacity of this area of spending in 2021-22 dollars is about 32.6 million dollars. When we say capacity in today's dollars, that is because if the area lasts for 30 years, there will be impact of inflation on the amount uh, on the spending. So what will cost us a dollar today will cost us more in 10 years and 15 years and 20 years. The maximum indebtedness, which is the line above the capacity number, would be about $56.9 million. And again, the difference between those two dollar numbers is the cost of inflation over that 30 year time period. Urban renewal comes in slowly at first because it's based off the increase in values within the area. We recognize that there is substantial investment happening right now in housing. And we are presently working with the city to get the information on the amount of those permits. So we anticipate that these numbers are going to change. And as soon as we are able to produce new numbers, we will produce those and provide those. So what types of projects are being considered in talent? The first types of projects are housing oriented solutions. So the main uh, ideas are to develop the ha housing stock for people whose incomes are at 30, 60 and 80% of the area median income for seniors and for those with mental health needs to do land banking. Land banking can stabilize the cost of the land for housing. There are programs that have land banking that work with nonprofits. And in land banking, it sometimes is more easy to develop duplexes, triplexes, fourplexes, and tiny homes. And then to purchase, to have a purchase program to fund manufactured and modular units for families under 30% of the area median income. I was very heartened to hear about the manufactured housing money that Representative Marsh talked about. Um, so I, I'm, I'm hopeful with that money and anything urban renewal could do if adopted will help um, people who had those kinds of homes. The second major area is vacant business corridor solutions. Some of the ideas that have been discussed are the development of incubator hubs. An incubator hub is where a number of small businesses work together and share resources. Those are often used for uh, cooking, culinary, for co-working, 
My my son actually uh, worked out of a co-working incubator hub where he had a computer and the whole facility had the printers and the internet access and the meeting rooms. And that works very well for a small business. Also for home-based startups, for business recruitment, some of the areas talked about are advanced manufacturing, healthcare, and hospitality, to provide capacity support for workforce training, and to look at incentives, tax credit incentives for businesses meeting diversity, equity, and inclusion standards is the anticipation that if the agency is able to provide those programs, that it will create equitable economic development and career opportunities in both urban and rural Oregon with, well, I think that was for DEI, um, with a special focus on engaging BIPOC workers and entrepreneurs. Another area is urban forestry. So do, to develop programs along greenways, to have streetscape improvements along business corridors and to promote Wagner Creek improvements. Multimodal transportation, so to improve walkability with schools and crossing of major streets and highways, to partner with Oregon Department of Transportation for a safe walk program, connections to Highway 99 corridor and Greenway, and to enhance pedestrian and bicycle routes. Emergency preparedness, so emergency resiliency satellite hubs, disaster preparedness, and signage wayfinding and routing to be able to use in case of another disaster. Parks, so improvements to parks in conformance with the parks master plan. For example, at the Suncrest Park Chuck Roberts Park at Soccer Fields and at Wagner Creek. And then just basic public infrastructure. So water, sewer, stormwater improvements, street improvements, street lights, public art. The, these um, examples are from Tiger, Lake Oswego, Astoria. And the first one, I don't remember. I think it's also Lake Oswego, the, the little people. Streetscape improvements, um, these are from Estacada and Hood River. Placemaking, these examples are from Sisters and Pendleton. Through the month of March, there was a survey on the Talent Urban Renewal Area Tura website to ask people to provide input on their most supported projects the projects that receive the most votes for the most supported. So we asked them to identify the top number one and then to identify their other projects that are supported. So as we had anticipated and as the city council and agency had provided input, the housing oriented solutions and the vacant business corridor assistance were those categories that received the most um, input as the most important projects. And they were followed by emergency preparedness, public infrastructure, urban forestry, multimodal transportation, parks, and arts. This just shows those responses in a pie chart because it gives you a good idea of how those were um, supported and the percentages. So the housing oriented solutions is in blue. The vacant business corridor solutions uh, is in that almost red color. Urban forestry in the green, multimodal transportation in the lavender, emergency preparedness in the aqua. So that was at 12%. Um, and then parks and arts were fairly low, and public infrastructure is at 9%. And like I told the agency and, uh, at, at City Against City Council, uh, you rarely in a public survey get support for public infrastructure because that's that that that's something I think people expect the city to provide anyway, and they get excited about all of these other things and seeing a water line under the street doesn't get really anyone excited. So although we all know it's necessary and those things need to be funded, 
it is um, very difficult to get the public to say that's a number one priority. So this again is the map that I can bring back up in a public discussion. So again, it shows uh, the proposed area in, in the blue. It shows how it works uh, in alignment with where the fire perimeter was. And then it shows some of those green spaces where um, there are anticipated improvements like to Wagner Creek or to um, wetlands areas. So the next step would be coordinating with the City of Talent staff on specific potential projects, um, coordinating or conducting detailed analysis of the permit data within the burn scar area. So that means the building permit data, which we are working on right now so that we have a better handle on what the amount of money would be in those initial years if an urban renewal area is formed right away. Conducting additional outreach to taxing districts to solicit specific programs and projects that could be realized within the proposed work plan area. And conducting public and multilingual outreach to ensure accessibility for all members of the talent community. So that is the end of my presentation. I will stop share, but be able to bring it back up if anybody wants to ask any questions about specific components. John? Oh, thank you, Elaine and uh, Madam Chair. Uh, we're, we'll be ready to go on to item number seven, which will be a presentation. You're on mute, Madam Chair. John, I have a question from the audience. I'm going to go ahead and take it because uh, we didn't specify. So, um, Vanessa, if you'll come forward and state your name, we'll take a question um, and uh, and we'll answer it real quick. But we won't uh, dialogue. We'll have an opportunity to do that later in the in the evening. Um, so, Vanessa, if you'll state your name and city for the record and ask a question. Um, John, is she coming through? Okay. Uh, can you hear me all right? Yeah. What's oh, your great. question? Um, my question is someone who is rebuilding a stick built home within the proposed turret area when the properties are assessed for for future taxes can we expect our property taxes to increase incrementally um, over the next several years in support of tura or is it like Elaine was mentioning that taxes within the Tura area will remain uh, stable? May I answer that? Yep, please, Elaine. Okay, so it's, uh, Vanessa, it's a combination of those. So the formation of an urban renewal area has nothing to do with, the, with what the assessor will assess your property. Um, and so the relationship between you and the assessor and your property and the assessor um, has nothing to do, urban renewal doesn't interfere with that. So the assessor will assess your new house at whatever value the assessor's office determines it is. And then that will be a real market value. And then they'll translate that to an assessed value. And that's all very complicated and I, I won't go into that tonight, but I can help you find information on that in the future. That assessed value would be the value on which the urban renewal agency would get their portion of taxes, but it doesn't increase the amount of taxes the assessor collects from you. And that assessed value, just like it did before the fire, will go up every year unless we're in a recession. And that's irrespective, has nothing to do with urban renewal area. That is just how 
tax assessment works in Oregon. Thank you, that, that clarifies it for me. I appreciate that. Okay, John. Okay, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, next up is uh, we have uh, from our sister city, uh, Executive Director Harry Weiss. Appreciate him taking time to come and present this afternoon on uh, evening. Um, and Harry, um, I'm going to start with your next slide here. So thank you for joining us, Eden. Well, thank you all for the opportunity to join you in this conversation tonight. And thank you, Elaine, for a great introduction to how urban renewal works. I'm just going to give some examples of how it has been used in Medford and how it has evolved over time to respond to changes that have taken place in the community. Um, and let me just preface by saying that, you know, the Urban Renewal District in Medford has been around since 1988. So we have a really long history of involvement in the community. And what we have done over time has changed and, um, you know, morphed according to what community needs are. Um, this first slide, uh, I wanted to show you uh, the map of our district, which is kind of an unusual looking district, has this kind of dumbbell organization where on the south end, you can see the portion that is what we know as uh, the Southgate retail uh, regional shopping area destination. And then it goes up I-5 and then it takes in the traditional downtown and then to the north, uh, what we call Liberty Park, the area between Liberty, uh, between Jackson Street and McAndrews, which is one of the early in-town uh, residential neighborhoods. Um, it's 575 acres. Um, its initial taxable value, its frozen base way back then was $125 million. And as Elaine explained, that tax base has continued to pay taxes to all the taxing districts. And all we got was the amount of the growth of the property tax uh, uh, levies on that. We don't we don't take anything away from the existing, uh, from, from what was the existing uh, tax base for those agencies. Um, and I thought Elaine's chart about the impacts to the taxing districts is very helpful because those aren't reductions in their current tax base. That's just based on what the future growth of revenues um, mean in terms of their future, uh, what, what, what taxes are being foregone. Um, I, I think it's worth, uh, revisiting, you know, what our primary mission is as an agency. It's to eliminate bright, blight and, and to um, prevent the depreciation of property values and attract jobs and attract private investment and stabilize property values going forward. And then, of course, also to protect the, uh, the notion of identity and our historic places and the values of the community. Um, you know, we, we work on the basis of capturing future tax growth in order to fuel investment in, um, in, in the community. And the very first project that Mira undertook was the South Gateway development. And this was a really interesting uh, um, way to launch urban renewal. In this view on the left-hand side, you can see an aerial photograph of the area um, from before we started. And on the right-hand side is the view today. You can see Walmart, uh, there's a Fred Meyer down there, it's Harry and David, there's a hotel. There are a number of hotels actually and some other commercial development. The brilliance of starting with this project in particular was that back in the day, all of this was land that was not even on the tax rolls. It was either under the control of the federal government, state government, the county or the city. And by assembling all this property and bringing it forward for redevelopment as a commercial uh, 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 district, it actually took non-tax productive property and put it on the rolls. And that really fueled the early days of urban renewal um, because it was wholly new tax revenue that didn't even exist because the taxing districts didn't have any uh, any way to assess these properties or levy against them because they were all exempt. So this has been a major engine for how our work over the past 35 years uh, has been funded. 
Can we have the next slide? And um, this is just a quick summary of the types of projects that we have done over the years. Um, we've done a lot of work on downtown parking, including two parking decks and multiple parking facilities, uh, uh, surface parking lots that serve commercial visitors as well as people who live downtown. We've been able to invest in high quality public spaces that include public art. We have Vogel Plaza, Pear Blossom Park, and a small vest pocket park in the Liberty Park neighborhood. Um, we put a lot of money into improving streetscapes, um, which also entailed a significant amount of utility relocation and utility enhancements. One of the challenges, of course, in a historic downtown is that much of the infrastructure is quite old and aged and aging out. So it needs to be uh, uh, either replaced or um, redone or rehabilitated in order to be able to support new development that comes in. Um, we were also able to take a significant amount of funding and put it into, um, into cultural institutions, as well as into facilities that serve our taxing districts who help pay for what we do. Um, so the Jackson County Library that's downtown on Central Avenue, Mira was involved in helping do all the land acquisition and facilitating that uh, investment in downtown. The creation of the Higher Education Center and RCC's downtown campus. Again, we were involved in that primarily on the land side, but once again, being able to work collaboratively to accomplish some of the things that our taxing districts want to do um, gives us a way to give some of that money back that they are foregoing in order to help fund urban renewal. And then some significant investments uh, in collaboration with private investors, especially the One West Main project and the Commons, which is uh, where the uh, uh, headquarters of Lithia Motors is located. And then we continue to do um, smaller kinds of interventions with rehabilitation loans, uh, we currently provide funding to help people do seismic retrofit and sprinkler system installation in buildings undergoing rehabilitation downtown. Um, more recently, a lot of that has been directed towards conversion of motels to housing, um, which has been a significant uh, initiative following the Alameda fire as we you know, saw so many people displaced and needing interim transitional housing um, uh, after their homes were lost in the fire. Currently, our agency is focused on the neighborhood north of downtown, primarily. We have a couple of projects in downtown as well. Um, and the work there in the Liberty Park neighborhood, significant amount of it is public space work, uh, reconfiguration of Central Avenue, uh, building neighborhood infrastructure for bikes and traffic calming, sidewalks, taking care of traffic. Um, we're going to wind up rebuilding one entire street, which is probably one of the worst streets in the entire city, Manzanita Street, and that will be about a one and a half million dollar project, uh, total rebuild from Riverside uh, to Court Street. Um, you know, housing has always been a major goal of Mira, especially uh, housing in downtown. And it has been something that has largely been elusive to the agency over the majority of its history. But in this last phase of Muro, which we are in, um, the city council that also serves as our urban renewal board has prioritized housing as the top thing that they want to try and accomplish in, in, uh, in the community and in downtown. And that has only been uh, emphasized even more so after the Alameda fire. Because the truth of the matter is we can talk about Mira and Medford and Tura and Talent as, you know, they all exist as jurisdictions that have their geographical location and their specific constraints about what they do as agencies and as governmental entities. But the truth is we are one large community in the Rogue Valley. And everything that happened in talent has direct impacts on the viability of the regional economy and the regional housing market. So the opportunity for Mira to step forward and address housing more directly 
uh, after the fire has been in response to the fact that we're all in this together and we all have a role that we can play in terms of meeting the larger regional needs for housing. Because without housing, we don't have a labor force. And without a labor force, we don't have a viable economy. So these are critical, critical investments that we are trying to make in housing to help carry some of the uh, the, the, the load that needs to be backfilled in our community. Uh, the, the projects that we are directly involved with with housing right now, um, you probably have heard about Project Turnkey. That was an initiative that was funded by the state legislature through the Oregon Community Foundation. Our local nonprofit agency, Rogue Retreat, in collaboration with the city of Medford, received a grant from uh, Oregon uh, Community Foundation to acquire a motel in Liberty Park. Uh, for conversion initially to transitional housing for fire victims, but ultimately to make that into permanent housing, uh, mainly studio apartments that would be uh, permanent housing going forward for uh, meeting the needs of um, people needing access to affordable rents. Um, our agency helped fund the rehabilitation of that building. We contributed $450,000 so far to that project. All in, that's going to be about a $3 million plus uh, conversion of that property. Uh, more recently, we've entered into a development agreement with Laz Ayala of KDA Homes for the development of a new 62 unit workforce housing project in downtown. Now, this is a market rate project that targets households that make between 80% and 120% of area median income. We know that we have needs for housing at every level, every economic strata in the city. Um, this is a particularly challenging segment of housing to try and build because the housing market is largely split into two ends. We have capital A, affordable housing serving people who make less than 60%, 50%, 30% of area median income. And then we have higher end housing. And the way it's kind of set up is that affordable housing has access to certain kind of funding sources and subsidies that can help get those things built. And of course, the upper end housing has profitable margins. So it attracts private development uh, because there's money to be made there. This middle segment, moderate and middle income housing is really tough because A, it's not profitable for in, in many cases, and B, it doesn't have access to subsidy. So this was a particularly interesting project for us to get involved in. As I said, it is a private investment in a market rate project, about a $13 million project. We are putting in $1.2 million to help make this project a go. It was financially infeasible without our contribution. And incidentally, it also happens to use something called the Opportunity Fund, the Opportunity Zone Investments that are uh, enabled under uh, federal law. The combination of those two made this into a very modestly profitable project. And we have a highly motivated investor who has been involved in our downtown for decades and wanted to see housing happen. And so the combination of those incentive uh, financial incentives that we were able to put together has made the difference in making this project um, uh, start. And we have groundbreaking next uh, next Tuesday. So we're very excited about that coming forward. Can we have the next slide? Um, the other project that you uh, uh, that was alluded to earlier in the present in the beginning of the meeting. Um, this is a project that has just been submitted to the state of Oregon for funding using the low income housing tax credit program, the 4% program, and uh, the lift program, which is a state program to support affordable housing. Um, we are doing this with a uh, joint venture development team, the Rubicon Edlin joint venture. Uh, Rubicon is a local investor. Um, Edlin is one of the most successful affordable housing developers in uh, the Northwest, and they have teamed up to propose a 113 unit apartment that will serve households making 60% of area median income or less. Um, 
our agency assembled the property. This is a location up on Central Avenue near the Les Schwab Tire Store, if you're familiar with that location, a three and a quarter acre property that we were able to acquire in 2019. We are donating the land, uh, which is worth about $1.7 million, and we're putting up um, $4.2 million in cash that comes from the TIF. So that's just the Mira contribution. The city is also pledged to provide property tax, tax abatement for this project, which allows the project to borrow a little bit more money on the front end uh, for their construction, about $2 million. So all told, the public resources going in for this project is about $8 million um, for a $48 million project. One of the things that we look for when we make these investments is how much can our local TIF leverage in terms of other sources of funding? And in this case, it's a seven to one ratio of outside dollars coming in to match what we're putting into the deal. Um, that's, a, that's a really substantial, uh, I'm sorry, five to one uh, ratio. That's a really substantial uh, uh, level of leverage that we aspire to. Um, I just want to close with a couple of observations. You know, our agency was formed on the basis of blight elimination and looking at revitalization. Talent has a very different kind of challenge because you are recovering from disaster. That's a different starting point from where we were, you know, 35 years ago when Mira started and from the kinds of issues that we that we deal with and have dealt with over the years. And we have only come to the housing issue rather late in the game. Um, so, you know, it's, a, it's an interesting time to be working in this. Um, we do have some other things that we're working on, but I, I, I do want to emphasize that throughout this, we have been able and sought out the opportunities where we can collaborate with the taxing districts, that they can accomplish some of their goals by collaborating with the sources of funds that we have to support them. And I'll close with one quick example. We, we took a run at creating what's what was a career technical education center. We had a warehouse on the property where we're building the, the uh, affordable housing complex. And we approached the Medford School District about whether they might want to adapt that building for a facility that would train high school students uh, for jobs to go into the construction industry. And we took a real hard run at it. It didn't quite fit the long-term needs or uh, the profile of what the school district wanted, wants to eventually accomplish for that kind of vocational training facility. But it was a very good exercise because it helped us identify what the long-term needs are for the community. And we purposely sought out their input uh, to say, do we have an opportunity here to collaborate with you to advance your mission and let us be a collaborating partner. Um, again, thank you for the opportunity to participate this evening and I'd be happy to answer questions as they come up. Any questions? Okay. Well, uh, here is the point uh, that we get to open up this um, uh, discussion for public comment. And the intention of an open house, which is not as formal as a regular meeting, is to really hear uh, from, from our residents and, and other interested parties um, you know, what their thoughts are about um, priorities and uh, approaches. Um, one thing I do want to point out is um, there has been a lot of uh, misinformation, and, and some of it has been mistakes for the most part. Um, but I, where there is um, big misinformation, um, uh, we will likely take a moment um, to either address it as a question or perhaps correct the misinformation. It hasn't served our community well um, to let some of the misinformation stand. And I'll give you an example. Um, and again, I think it's more a mistake than anything else, but uh, this is the kind of thing that I, I think I would take a moment to correct uh, at the appropriate time. Uh, an example of a mistake of information might be that 
uh, urban renewal agencies are only allowed to mitigate blight as part of their um, menu of uh, war allowed work. Uh, it, that would be uh, the type of thing that would be correct corrected. Um, and, and to say in that case uh, that there uh, is other uses for urban renewal, one of which is in a state of emergency declared by the governor, um, urban renewal agencies can be used to recover after a catastrophe that includes fire, flood, and other types of natural disasters. So, so um, yeah, not to not to suggest that we'll uh, I'll be looking to point out when folks are are you know mildly mistaken, but when there is um, really incorrect information, we'll probably take uh, a, a moment to check in with Elaine just on accuracy because we want to leave this evening with everybody having you know a clear picture of. Uh, a clear and accurate and correct picture of, of how urban renewal agencies work and what they can do for our community, et cetera. Um, so on that, uh, John, we'll go ahead and start taking speaker request forms if that's how we have it lined up tonight. Yes, Madam Mayor. Um, I think the first one you had was uh, on here is Matt Witt and I'm gonna bring him forward here. And John, do I have the, uh, do I have the, uh, the grid? somewhere you should have it i emailed you email it. it to me yeah you should okay. go pull it up i can All right. send it to you here too i'll look for it on my other screen okay i'm going to uh bring matt what he was first here first and then if you'll re-email that to me i'll, I'll be yeah. able to pull it up All right matt please state your name and city for the record and you have three minutes and can i ask one of the members to use a timer Any volunteers? Uh, Mr. Vice Chair, perhaps? Could you run a three minute timer for me? Yes, I can. Thank you so much. All right, Matt. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, um, Matt Witt, I'm a resident of the talent community. And like many others, I had to evacuate uh, when the fire came close to my house. After a week without water or electricity, I was able to return home, but many people I know were not so lucky. Many of them still have not been able to return to talent because of skyrocketing home prices and rents, a problem that we all know we had even before the fire. Most of us hoped that talent could rebuild in a way that addressed our lack of affordable housing and that brought all our families home, strengthened our small businesses, and made us better prepared to prevent or withstand future fires. Some of that has happened, but not nearly enough and not fast enough. The past year and a half have demonstrated that just leaving our recovery to big profit-making developers and land speculators and to gentrification will not prioritize the needs of talent residents. And we can all just look around and see that. Our community needs funding to develop new housing stock that is truly affordable, to acquire land for nonprofit housing development, to assist families who otherwise couldn't afford to buy, to promote energy efficiency and renewable energy, to make our infrastructure and buildings more fire resistant and to get our small businesses back on their feet. That funding will have to come from multiple sources and one of those is Talent's Urban Renewal Plan, which will do so without raising tax rates. I'm someone who's equally concerned about housing affordability and fire preparation. And I'm so appreciative of our leaders who, by the way, serve as volunteers and who have worked so hard since the fire to put people first. The presentation tonight said that talent is reaching out to the fire district along with other agencies, but to the fire district to discuss ways that urban renewal can help prevent future fires and make our buildings and infrastructure more fire resistant. I hope the fire district takes that opportunity 
because we all saw in September 2020 that firefighters and fire trucks, as important as they are to all of us, are not enough. Thank you very much for everything you're doing. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Matt. And um, I do want to say that I'm going to be a little lenient on the three minutes tonight because I know folks are doing their best to support the translation tonight. So if you run a little bit long to do that, um, I, I want to support you in doing that. Um, so I'll try to ask you to stay close to it, but also, um, you know, really appreciate being mindful for the translator. All right, the next speaker is Todd uh, Honer. Todd, if you'll come forward and state your name and city for the record. Todd Honer, um, Talent, Oregon. I didn't expect to speak tonight. I had written some comments um, to John earlier. I've been listening. Um, I would like to I assume, uh, first of all, I'm one of the people who uh, lost their homes. I, uh, our, our location is 213 Talon Avenue and uh, it's just right next to the Talon Irrigation District. I wrote a comment uh, when I heard about this meeting um, to uh, encourage, I assume, um, the uh, perhaps the looking into moving um, the, the, the restart up, I guess, of moving or, or trying to convince town irrigation district to move, uh, relocate. And I'd made a suggestion that the fabricated glass company over here off Rap Road, where we are housed in an apartment, my wife and I, um, was recently closing down. And I thought it would be a great opportunity for them to maybe uh, the turret, perhaps the city to figure out some way to perhaps do well, relocate these guys to a, a location that they could, uh, they could use and uh, a, a little bit more feasible than the downtown area, which I consider for all the good things that uh, TID does kind of a blight, especially with the barbed wire compound that sits right in the center of city. So um, uh, I wrote those recommendations down. I also wrote some recommendations or suggestions uh, to uh, uh, regarding uh, high density um, development in a high density area, but how, you know, the fire resistant or uh, resiliency is sort of compromised with a lot of high density and a lot of developers are putting more uh, uh, more development on some of the smaller lots and getting, I think, approval by the planning commission or planning department, yeah, planning commission. Anyway, uh, I don't know where my time is on this. Um, my comments were written down. I agree with uh, what Matt just said as I, and uh, that's all I've got to say. I think uh, just read my comments. That's it. Thank you, Todd. And we did receive your comments uh, and we appreciate hearing from you. Now, just to mention, um, I, I, I couldn't agree with you more about um, just the ongoing negotiation to try to relocate TID and ne negotiate ways to help them to do that. It's an ongoing effort. Um, and sure. um, it gets complicated. We really appreciate you um, bringing that voice to this conversation. Um, okay, so the next speaker, and by the way, if you feel like you just wanna stand with your written comments, you can certainly say that you've submitted written comments and you just wanna leave it at that. I, I don't want anybody to uh, speak if that's uh, not uh, their comfort zone. So uh, with that, we do have uh, Max, Tensher. And and um, I just, John, I am reading off the right list. Is that right? Yes, uh, Chair okay. Ursula. And I'm looking to see if Max is on here. He did send in. Uh, 
he, you know, he did send in a public speaker's request here and a comment here too. Um, Max, if you're in the audience, if you can do the raised hand, I can promote you to talk here. Uh, Madam Chair, I'll just include his comments on the uh, the uh, upload here for the agenda meeting here too. And Along I do see, the... see that there is a raised hand in the audience. Um, oh, yeah. And for those folks who are raising their hand, I will go with the written requests first, and then uh, then I'll go to um, I'll go to the uh, to the audience with raised hands. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, and Mr. Luz, I do see uh, you are on the list, so I'll get to you uh, before I go to the audience. Um, so the next speaker is Janet Levins. Is Janet here? Who's that? It doesn't look like it. We do have her written comments for the record. So I'll go ahead and move then to Bonnie, Bonnie Morgan. Are you here, Bonnie with us? Yes. So Bonnie, when you get a chance, please state your name and city for the record. And you. Um, hello, I'm Bonnie Morgan and um, I live in Ashland, but my heart is in talent. Uh, we have two properties in downtown, ta on downtown talent on Talent Avenue that burned. Um, Hanscom Hall, where Richard had his bookstore, and the property next to it, the concrete wall structure with the stepped parapet. Um, Malgram Garage. And I worked in that building for 30 years. So uh, talent's really near and dear to my heart. Um, I just wanted to speak to Talent Urban Renewal and what really great things they've done for our city. I first, um, my first experience with Talent Urban Renewal was 30 years ago when Marla Cates was the director. And she worked really hard to develop Old Town Talent, that concept, uh, lots of street improvements to really help the downtown. And she really encouraged us to do the renovation of Hanscom Hall. And we didn't get any money to do it, but what she was able to do, and which I see Urban Renewal doing now, is just to help us connect with the right people to get the job done. So that networking um, is so important, I think, in the city. Um, it, then, oh, probably 15 years after uh, we initially uh, finished Hanscom Hall, uh, there were some grants available to um, upgrade storefronts. And gosh, I think that whole block took advantage of that. And um, it sure spruced up that whole side of Talent Avenue. So I've really seen firsthand what um, Urban Re Renewal can, can do. And I'm, I'm pretty excited to see it expand out onto Highway 99 and to really help the properties out that way. Um, anyway, I just want to say, uh, job well done. Um, I've been to so many city council and Tura meetings and planning commission meetings and architectural review meetings in, in the last six months. And I just see a lot of people working really hard to try to bring resources to talent to help us all rebuild. And I really appreciate it. Thank you, Bonnie. And we're all waiting with bated breath for Malmgren Garage to uh, be restored. And um, really great that you're working with George Kramer to do that. And I just want to point out, uh, give you a, a thank you for pointing out the really successful history that this great agency has enjoyed. In fact, we were just recently invited to the League of Oregon Cities about, I don't know, three or four years ago um, as one of the more successful agencies in the state. And uh, we gave a presentation at League of Oregon Cities. We're really proud of the work that we've done and really appreciate that it goes noticed. Um, and so with that, if we can bring Jerry Hauk forward. Uh, Madam Chair, I think there's a Jerry I'm gonna allow to talk. Yep, there's his hand and we find him. There he is. 
Mary, can you state your name and city for the record? Oh, there we, there we go. Now you got me. Uh, Jerry Houck, live in Ashland. Um, I'm the president of Oak Valley Homeowners Association and excitedly waiting for my house to be rebuilt in, in Oak Valley itself. We had some extra issues dealing with uh, Wagner Creek and the floodplain, the floodplain elevation. Our concern is, as a president, I have, I'm speaking quite a bit on my property owners that are they're rebuilding, and they are still concerned about the taxes. And we understand the tax situation, as you explained, where you have the level amount that goes to, this, to the H city and the other agencies, and that excess going to, to Tura. Our question is, what date are you going to be using to start that? That's going to be a real factor, because if you start, see, this is, might be some misinformation that's out there. Some information is stating that they're going to use September 9th, 2020 as the property values. And if you do that, the cities will get next to nothing going on for the next 10, 20, 30 years, whatever. And you got to remember, even if you have that flat amount that goes and they get their two or three percent, inflation is still a factor in the cities and these agencies are going to need extra dollars. And how are they going to be getting these extra dollars other than through possibly other you know, uh, taxation or, or requests and funds. And that's the concern. You know, Oak Valley's 55 plus community and many of them in talent are 55 plus. And that means for many people a fixed income. And so this really has to be consideration. But our main factor is we would hope that the evaluation would be after these homes are being rebuilt, not the new homes built that were never there before the fire, but those that were destroyed by the fire as they're rebuilt, that should be the base. That's what our feeling and our belief is. And, and, and you know, it's something that it's very important because, you know, we have to, we have to survive as individuals. And, and inflation in general is really out of hand at the present time. Another question that's brought up is why does it have to be a 30-year plan? Why not a 10-year or a 20-year? Again, passing forward questions that I'm hearing from my people. My, not from my people, but from the people from Oak Valley and some other people I, I know in town itself. So um, that's it. And uh, you have some other comments for me, but I, that's all I really have. My question, hopefully we get some answers on this. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jerry. And we, uh, we're pulling for you to get back home. Um, I do think that uh, Elaine Howard answered a very similar question earlier when she said that we are evaluating uh, several scenarios. Uh, and so um, that, that decision hasn't been made. In fact, I think it's um, that we are reviewing that, uh, that question. No full decision has been made. It will depend on our analysis of the current permits housing under construction. construction. So that's a yet to be determined. Uh, but thank you for your input. The next speaker on the list is Allie Rosenbluth. Allie, please come forward and state your name and city for the record. And Jerry, if you'll take your hand down, please. Madam Chair, I don't see a raised hand for Allie. I'm looking through everyone here. I don't see Allie. If you're out there, if you can raise your hand, that would help us. I'm sure I'll, I'll include her comments in the uh, posting of the meeting minutes here. Thank you, uh, John. The next uh, speaker is speaker request is for Lucas Wiedemann. Lucas in the audience. I'm sure I don't see Lucas in the audience either. Okay. Um, Then the next speaker would be Mike Oxendine. Mike, are you with us tonight? Uh, 
There's a mic. I think my, oh, there we go. Actually. Hi, good evening. I'm Mike had to depart and, um, uh, and I was going to read his comments for him. Can you state your name and city for the record? Yeah, this is uh, Derek Volkart, um, Greater Talent Area. Uh, reading Mike Oxendine's comments. Mike is uh, chair of uh, Talent Urban Forestry Committee, but his comments are as a resident of talent. And Mike writes, thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. Rebuilding our community after the Almeida fire provides incredible opportunities to design a better, more sustainable and equitable urban environment for future residents of talent. Climate change is already very present in Southern Oregon and the Almeida fire severity was a result of increased annual droughts and higher than normal temperatures. The Bear Creek Greenway is a critical wildlife and ecological corridor through our valley. The Greenway needs to be restored and properly managed to prevent a future Almeda fire. Our entire community's urban forest needs to be restored and replanted post fire. A heat island is an area, typically urban, that experiences higher temperatures than natural areas. Structures such as buildings, roads, and other infrastructure absorb and re-emit the sun's heat more than natural landscapes such as forests and water bodies do. With the destruction of the canopy cover over Bear Creek, our neighborhoods and along our roads, Talent's heat island effect is going to explode over the next few years. It is critical that we address this issue. I urge the citizens of Talent to support an urban renewal plan that incorporates the concepts of environmental design that create a sustainable city infrastructure with lower crime rates, increased economic activity, and improved public health. We can do better designing, managing, and planting our urban forest, which will help prevent another Almeda disaster. The health and management of Talent's urban forest is just one of the many issues that the Talent Urban Renewal Agency is looking at to help strengthen our community and improve our resilience. The Talent Urban Forestry Committee is dedicated to working alongside Tura to create and implement a plan to plant, maintain, and preserve an equitable tree canopy for all citizens of Talent. And that's from Mike Oxendine, resident of Talon. Thank you, Derek. The next person on the list is Chris Loves. Chris, come forward and state your name and city for the record, please. Hi, it's Chris Loves, and I'm in Phoenix. And Madam Mayor, thanks for hosting the meeting, uh, the open house. It's a great way for citizens to express their concerns, compliments, and suggestions. I was relieved to hear that you're going to relax the three minute rule a bit, but I'll try to be succinct. I was gonna rush through what I had to say, but now I don't have to, which is great. Um, I also wanna thank John for responding to my emails. I had some questions and he was graciously uh, responsive. You know, I did attend the March 16th meeting where Elaine spoke about assisting over a hundred urban renewal agencies, but none with a fire disaster area. Now, it's my understanding that you may select January 2021 as the frozen base date, and the new urban renewal plan overlaps much of the burn scar area, and that Tiberius Solutions did the UR growth projections using a growth rate of 7.2%. Again, that's 7.2% projection. Elaine also mentioned that every dollar of tax um, is important to the overlapping taxing districts 
who lose funds like Fire District 5 and Jackson County. And she mentioned that we didn't wanna hide the growth rate. But the growth rate number of 7.2% is my major uh, concern with what's going on with regards to the urban renewal agency. I believe it's not only like five or 10% off the mark, but hundreds of percent off the mark. And I'm gonna tell you why with some numbers. And Jordan alluded to this situation at the last meeting. What we're looking at is an area that was destroyed by the fire, of course, when the fire came through, it destroyed the homes. When the homes gets destroyed, the assessed value dramatically decreases because it's just a, a blank tax lot. And subsequently, you'll see a dramatic increase in the taxes from that tax lot once a home is built, especially in today's market, because the home values and the assessed value will be much, much greater than it was, I believe, before the fire. Now, I went out and I looked at a number of tax lots in your burn scar area to give an idea as just how we, just how we can project a scenario that I'm about to tell you about to the rest of the area. I looked at 477 and 455 Arnos, 609 Talent Avenue, and 302 Rap. They all had tax lots where homes burned and the assessed value dropped dramatically as did the taxes. The average assessed value, $73,000. Average tax rate, 1186. So again, 73,000, 1186 in taxes. When you add a home to those lots, and they're building homes on those lots now, you're gonna see again, a dramatic increase in the taxes. If you look at a couple of homes on Summer Lane in your area with values of 300 to 381, the taxes are 5,000 to $6,000. So given that scenario, you can see tax rates go from 1186 up to five or $6,000, which is a 500 to 600% increase. Now the exact numbers aren't that important. What's important is to recognize the dramatic increase in tax revenue that comes off of those properties after a home goes on to them. If you take a 500% increase in value, bring that over the 30 years of your taxing of your urban renewal lifespan, that's 17% in simplest terms. At the 3% growth rate, and you're at a growth rate of 20%, not 7.2. The 7.2 versus 20% is a 300% discrepancy. Now, maybe I'm missing something here, guys, but I don't think I am. I'd love for Elaine or maybe John to address it. I don't want to you know, mention the scenario to other taxing districts or other individuals without really knowing what I'm talking about, but I think I know what I'm talking about. The dramatic increase in taxes will flow to the urban renewal district and away from the overlapping taxing districts if you use, again, a frozen base rate of January 2021, because that's a rate based on just raw land. Love to hear from Elaine or maybe John about this and you know, we can have a dialogue, I guess, or a bit of a conversation if, if appropriate. Thank you. Mr. Les, can you submit your... Um your comments in writing? I sure can. That way. Uh, but, but Madam, I, I do want to send them to you, but I don't want to send them to other taxing districts without hearing from Elaine or John about why it may be completely off the mark or maybe on the mark. Uh, right, so my hope is, I mean, that's not, that was a lot to unpack without having it in writing. And my hope is that you can provide it to the jurisdiction in writing and, and give Elaine uh, an opportunity to review what you have. It sounded very unscientific to be fair and uh, to, to review your comments and then um, uh, and evaluate them and, and, and perhaps respond. And I don't wanna be scientific. I just wanna point out the fact that assessed value for raw land at a frozen base date versus putting a home on it. And Elaine always mentions how the growth and tax increment financing is slow to begin with in most districts. In this case here, it's just the opposite. You'll see a dramatic increase in TIF coming in as opposed to a slow increase. That's my point, not to be scientific, but just to get that scenario out there that the increase will be dramatic in the beginning years. That's it. 
Appreciate it. Um, so uh, you can, if you'll send those comments into um, the urban renewal site, that would be really helpful. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, the next speaker is Angeline Lacey. Angeline, please come forward and state your name and city for the record. Um, can you hear me first? Yes. Okay, Angeline Lacey and uh, I live in Talent, Oregon. And I guess that's all you needed to know right now for the record. Um, are you ready to hear my comment? Yes, please. Okay, um, anyway, thank you very much for putting on this um, presentation. Um, I've learned a lot about um, the urban renewal and it's been interesting to listen to all the speakers. So thank you very much. And um, what I'm bringing forth is we, um, our company Sunday afternoons um, headquarters were lost in the Alameda fire. And we are now renting in Ashland. And as we get ready to rebuild in talent, where the cost of building has really skyrocketed. And the development costs and permits and everything has us thinking if it's better to remain in Ashland or is there some help from the city or from the um, urban renewal um, group to assist us on this? We employ between 50 and 60 people, which, and we had been in talent for 15 years. Our employees go to the restaurants in talent, use the facilities. A lot of our people live in talent. So it's a, we um, provide a lot of, um, I guess, um, business to the city of talent. And now that we're building, we're just wondering, the price has really doubled what we thought it would be. And just wondering if there's a program out there that could assist. Thank you, Angeline. You're welcome. Um, at, at this time, um, I can say that there are, um, working with Talent Business Alliance and looking for funding to help um, it, displaced businesses, which we uh, consider to be fire survivors as well. Um, we have not been able to find any significant um, CD, C, CDBG grants or anything like that, but we, we continue to work on it. And, and that is um, uh, in part, part of the design, designed in programs for um, this, this new urban renewal district. And just to say that your location, what isn't in the current district. Um, so it's outside of the current urban renewal reach unfortunately, but we keep looking and we'll stay in, uh, Talent Business Alliance will stay in contact with you uh, to, to try and answer that question. Okay, are there anybody from the audience that um, wishes to speak? Any comments or additions from any of the members? All right, staff, anything from you? Closing remarks? Uh, Madam oh, Chair. Uh, I, do, I do have a, uh, another hand up. I'm sorry, John. Derek Volkart, you want to come forward and state your name and city for the record? Yeah, thank you. Uh, Derek Volkart, uh, Greater Talent Area. And uh, owner of a uh, large, what I consider to be a large note with a lending institution on real property and talent. Um, and I just, I guess I wanted to comment um, and I hope it's not um, too repetitive um, that the Oregon statute um, uh, for urban renewal 
notes exceptions to plan requirements for disaster for disaster areas. And um, I just want to take a brief moment to read some of the statute language that notwithstanding any other provisions of ORS chapter 455 or 456 or this chapter where the governing body of a municipality certifies that an area is in need of redevelopment or rehabilitation as a result of flood, fire, hurricane, hurricane, earthquake, storm, or other catastrophe respecting which the governor has certified the need for disaster assistance under federal law. The governing body may declare a need for an urban renewal agency if necessary and may approve an urban renewal plan and an urban renewal project for such area without regard to the provisions requiring one, I'm going to truncate this, the urban renewal plan conform to the comp plan or economic development plan and that the urban renewal to the urban renewal agency be a blighted area. I just want to state that as a, uh, as a taxpayer and talent that believes that it is um, your duty as a board to uh, represent the, the taxpayers and talent. And while um, I was in the old urban renewal district and won't be in the new one, um, I do think it is the best use of taxpayer dollars within the city of talent to uh, have an urban renewal district. And I would argue that any municipality foregoing that would be doing a disservice to the residents. Um, and I also wanted to read that because I note that there's no mention of a need for um, any percentages or increase in values or any sort of numbers, but following a disaster, um, it is a really wise use to launch into urban renewal. Thank you all for your uh, service to the community and thank you for the time. Thank you. All right, uh, one more chance if anybody else has their hand up. John, do you have closing remarks? Uh, Madam Chair, I just want to th thank everyone and all the uh, everyone that came and participated tonight. It was great to uh, get all your comments there. And, and uh, Elaine, did you have any closing comments? Appreciate your time tonight. I think it was very helpful for the community. I, I had one thing. Someone had put in a question about where they could look at the map um, better. And I believe there's even an interactive map that you can zoom in on at. Um, John, can you give how people would access that? Yeah, it's a, if you go to the Talent Urban Renewal um, website, we have an interactive map there. Uh, Nikki hart has helped us create that working with the city. So it's very helpful there, so. Thank you. All right, well, uh, thank you, John. Uh, thank you, uh, Elaine, for the great presentation. Also wanna thank Representative Pam Marsh and Alex Campbell uh, for giving us an update on um, the uh, HUD funding progress. Um, and also thank you to the community who has been um, really responsive in in bo at both the survey level and also with uh, comments. It's really uh, helps a lot to hear from our community. Um, we look forward to the, um, uh, the visioning on Saturday. John, I might as well go ahead and plug that yeah. real quick. Yes, yeah, yeah, please do, Madam Mayor. Um, so the first, so on Saturday at Community Center, we'll be doing a Your City, Your Vision. Um, exercise. It starts at nine o'clock Saturday morning, and then there's a second one at twelve thirty. Is that right? Uh, one thirty, Madam Chair. One thirty, um, and uh, that'll be an opportunity for uh, everyone to look at the community as a whole and where we want to see um, uh, our recovery go from here. And uh, so we're hoping to see some uh, some great turnout. It should be a great day. Uh, there's also a citywide, uh, there's also an event downtown. Is that the, that's the art event at Malmgren Garage. 
um, yes, on that same sure. day. So uh, it should be a lovely day in talent that day. Um, with that, I'll go ahead and close this meeting at 8.36. Oh, I'm sorry, Member Pestizo? Um, yeah, I just, I tried to follow John's recommendation to look at that map and I went to the um, Urban Renewal Agency webpage and it's really not apparent to me how to find that map on here. So I thought maybe John could give a little more direction. We'll put it, you know what we'll do, uh, Board Member Prestige, we'll put it on the front page for everyone, a link there. Uh, yeah, I think that would be helpful. Thanks. You're welcome. I make these things and I couldn't find it. <laughs> I know you make them, yeah. And we've, we've been put, you know, the, the website, we've put out so much information, you know, and, and it, uh, but we'll, we'll put it right on the front page the, and the work that uh, Nikki's done is a great interactive map and we've been doing, you know, so uh, we'll have it right on the easy click button for everyone. Here. Yeah, I think that'll be helpful at least for the little bit of the future here. Yeah. And if anybody's looking for it right now, it is on um, the tab that's called proposed work plan towards it's about um, two, it's about three quarters of the way down. And clear as a bell. All right, so um, I still think we should move it to the uh, front page. We'll put it, yeah. we'll put it on. <laughs> um, all right, um, so this meeting's adjourned at 838. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye.